that came out of an economics textbook, I'm afraid. Not a very good one, I could say. Not my textbook. <laughs> but out of an economic textbook. And we applied it for 20 years. In the meantime, the AIDS pandemic ravaged Africa. Drug resistance to chloroquine meant that the continent most impacted by malaria because of its ecological vulnerability <coughs> was in a rampant malaria pandemic as well. Now, Africa was bound to be tougher than Asia for a lot of reasons. You don't have the great irrigation, riverine civilizations. Asia has the Indus and the Ganges and the Brahmaputra and the Mekong and the Yangtze and the Yellow Rivers. And these are where the great civilizations emerge because of irrigation, because of reliable water sources. Africa doesn't have that. Africa has malaria much worse than the others. Africa has crop varieties that we don't have, so it took extra time to get the research done. Fourteen African countries are landlocked. That's a very tough situation to be in the world, because I'm sure everyone in San Francisco can appreciate the port is key for international trade. The port is key for prosperity. But you have Burkina Faso, and Mali, and Chad, and Niger, and uh, Rwanda, and Burundi, and Uganda, and Botswana, and Zambia, and Zimbabwe, and many others that have a tough time because they have to pass an international boundary. And that's not so easy because, you know, when politicians go to connect roads, maybe they connect it with their constituency, but they don't necessarily connect it with their neighbor. And so landlocked countries from time immemorial have had it tough and Africa has a lot of that. It's got rain-fed agriculture. It's got mosquitoes that are uniquely nasty in transmitting malaria. It had uniquely nasty colonization that followed 100 years of imperial rule, that followed centuries of slave trade, that left Africa by the time of independence without trade manpower, without skilled labor, without infrastructure. It was always going to be harder. And Africa suffers the racism of the rest of the world, without question. But Africa also then fell prey to our doctrine. If you're not doing it yourself, we're not going to help you. Rather than, if you help yourself, we're going to be there together with you. As President Kennedy said in 1961, January 20th, in his inaugural address, that we commit ourselves to our best efforts to help those, help themse help those living in the Hudson villages around the globe, to help them help themselves. That's the doctrine of solidarity. But somehow, we left it in abeyance. Well, what happened in the last 20 years is that the misery increased the extreme poverty deepened, the environmental crisis deepened, the AIDS pandemic spread, malaria surged, crop yields stagnated or worse, and global climate change impacted parts of Africa. Probably the dry parts of Africa have become considerably drier because of man-made global climate change. This is an absolutely proof, I have to say, but it's hinted at what is without doubt is that the climate instability has made places like the Sahel, like Darfur, a lot more, a lot drier and a lot deeper in crisis than they were 20 years ago. And they were already deeply in crisis. Well, that's the diagnosis. So does it, is it all hopeless? Or can we learn something from where success has come? I was honored to be asked by Kofi Annan in 2002 to work with him on the Millennium Development Goals. And let me say, I'm not the author of them. Oh, I wish, wish I were. They're so nice. The world is the author of them. World governments all agreed to them in the year 2000. 
if there is a promoter of them, the prime mover uh, in our recent times, it's definitely Secretary General Kofi Annan, one of the most wonderful and beautiful people on our planet, and a great leader, and uh, somebody that we should treasure for all he's done with his soft voice, and his marvelous human spirit, and his universal outlook, and he's had been given a hard time in our country, absolutely unfairly and unjustly, for recent years, without uh, any uh, any of uh, that hard time merited at all. He's he has done more to hold this world together in a very fragile and difficult time than anyone that I know on the planet. Well, he was a mover of the Millennium Development Goals in 2000. He asked me in 2002 to help him find ways to make these goals real and practicable. One thing I found is people of goodwill all over the world were ready to jump to this. I was able to get together a network of about 265 leading scientists, development practitioners, civil society leaders from around the world to work for three years on a volunteer basis to produce the results of the UN Millennium Project. Fifteen volumes of detailed analysis of how malaria can be controlled, how Africa can grow more food, how AIDS uh, victims can be saved with antiretroviral medicines, how, malaria, how AIDS can, transmission can be broken, <coughs> how safe drinking water can reach the poorest of the poor. The fact of the matter is that what happened in Asia can happen in Africa. It requires thinking very practically. We don't need to think idealistically. The more practical we are, the closer we are to reaching our ideals, I can tell you. Because if we're absolutely practical, we'll be driven to the solution of high-yield seeds. We'll be driven to the solution of anti-malaria bed nets. We'll be driven to the solution of bore wells that can give a woman in a village water right in her village rather than after a 10-kilometer arduous climb to an unsafe spring. We can use the internet to get right into a village for, con for connectivity, to help villagers know when international transport is going to be available for their crops, or what prices are for vanilla or, uh, or for mangoes, uh, or for uh, other uh, products, green beans that they might grow, or for distance learning. All of these things are now available to anybody in the world at the cost of a simple satellite dish. That's a miracle, except it's very practical. So the solutions for escape from poverty do not require an overturning of society. They do not require a revolution. They do not require even that we tithe our income. They don't even require 1% of the rich world income. We found time and again in our studies, and I've been leading these studies for many years, that the 36-year commitment unfulfilled to 0.7% of rich world GNP, just 70 cents on the $100, will be sufficient to ensure that the Green Revolution, the Health Revolution, the Connectivity Revolution reaches everybody in the world. Isn't that amazing? We're so rich now with our 12 trillion dollar economy that we can ensure that the basic solutions reach everybody for just 0.7 percent of our income. It is the bargain of our generation. It's the bargain of our world. Yet we refuse to take up the bargain. We're all good bargain hunters. You know how to shop well for the best product. Let me pitch to you 0.7.